Just got back from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. And so this episode, we're just gonna have to wing it. Didn't really have time to prepare. June 19th, 2014 on the People's Radio! The People's Radio is an experimental technocratic media format for the working class. The thoughts and opinions expressed on The People's Radio are not necessarily the thoughts and opinions of Organizing for Humanity, of The People's Radio, or of anyone else. Viewer discretion is advised. I'm back, I'm back, and better than ever. Got a nice little vacation out west. Stayed at the fabulous Red Rock Casino Resort and Hotel and Spa. They have this really cool circular swimming pool. Got to take my daughter swimming in it. My daughter is now one year old. Think about that. Think about how time flies. It's amazing. Ah, story time. I've got to tell you what happened while we were out there. Uh, We went out there for the International, International Behavioral Neuroscience Society annual meeting. And... While I was there, I pl- I got to play a lot of craps. I got I got to play a lot of table games because you know there was a lot of downtime, uh, a lot of time that my wife was attending uh, certain seminars and what have you. So you know I I'd, I'd hit the tables, have some fun, and craps is my favorite game. Now if you understand mathematical odds then you should know never ever play craps. <laughs> the game is not in your favor. But you know, I budget a little mu- bit of money every every time we go out there, and, and I consider it entertainment for the evening. Uh, you know, get a couple of drinks for free. Well, it's not for free because you're gambling, of course. But, uh, you know, I, I see it as entertainment. You know, I know that I'm going to I'll go to that table thinking to myself, I'm going to lose this money. But what I'm paying for... What I'm losing that money for is the atmosphere uh, that comes with the craps table. Uh, if you've never played the game before, it's a lot of fun. Um, if the tables start betting together on the, the pass line, and then when the dice come out and you hit that pass line, everybody can cheers. Woo! They start clapping. Everybody makes money together. It can be a very fun experience, and that's what I pay for. I pay for the experience to gamble. The experience, the the adrenaline rush that you get from gambling. It's it's like watching a sport. It's kind of the same thing. You win some, you lose some, you cheer some, you cry some. But it's story time. Let me tell you what happened. Because this has got to be one of the weirdest experiences of my adult life. I'm playing craps at, uh, I don't know, about 11 o'clock at night or so. And everybody's having a good time. The table's been uh, having a good time. There was a couple of scientists there from the uh, conference. And we were all having a good time. And all of a sudden, this guy comes up to my left. And he starts playing. And, uh, you know, you get a little uh, table chat from time to time around the craps table. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not exactly how it started or who started it, but this guy just starts talking about politics. And, oh boy, did he pick the wrong guy to talk about politics with, because I'm very passionate about that subject. If you listen to the show, you should know that. And he just started talking about all blah, 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 blah. Evil socialism, blah, 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 blah. Those damn liberals, blah, 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 blah. And I pointed out, oh man, you're next to a liberal, and you should know there's scientists at this table. <laughs> and somehow or another, the conversation steered because he got he got extremely defensive, and he, you know how you know how people can get when they get all defensive and they just start switching topics, you know, like, well, what do you say about this? Oh, what do you say about that? Well, what do you say about this? That's what he was doing, and they even. <laughs> They even brought in new a, a new dealer to the table, one of the one of the bigger, more muscular guys, you know. 
because he was he was really red in the face, mad, getting out of hand, and everybody was kind of like, "Hey, man, calm down." And I I'd picked up my chips and I'd moved away from him at this point. But then it it just took a turn for the weird, because we're trying to ignore him at this point, and then suddenly out of nowhere he just screams, "Big Ozzy!" It was it was insane. It was incredible. People were looking at him as though he were an alien. And this actually happened a few days before the latest Benghazi news. If you've been watching CNN, if you've been watching uh, Google News, if you've been on Reddit, then you should know they got the ringleader of the Benghazi attack. They arrested him. He is in custody right now. And guess what he says? He says that he attacked the embassy because he was angry about a YouTube video that mocked Islam. Now, if you've been following this whole Benghazi conspiracy nonsense that the Republicans completely made up, you would know that Obama came out after the Benghazi embassy attack and he said, we believe that this was a terrorist attack on behalf of a video on the internet on YouTube. And the Republicans have been swearing up and down ever since that that was a lie made up by the president and that it's a conspiracy. Now, they've never actually explained the conspiracy, but it goes something along the lines of this. Apparently, Hillary and Obama were like watching a live video feed of the attack and they just sat there on their thumbs and they didn't order troops to go in and to save them or rescue them. And this is just ludicrous to me. Why? What political game could there arise from such an action? What politi- Why would they do that? That makes no sense to me. Either Obama is this evil tyrant dictator that the Republicans try to make him out to be, or he's this apathetic liberal coward. Which one is it? Which one is it? Anyway, if you look into the whole Benghazi thing, you'll, you'll see that while they were under attack, they were, there was a complete breakdown in the chain of command, which happens from time to time in our bureaucratic system and they could not get them help in time, and they were in the dark for the longest, and they didn't know exactly what was going on. So they didn't even know how to send help or what sort of help needed to happen. It was a big clusterfuck, and it happens. Government messes up. Government is run by people. It is run by government workers. There's going to be mistakes the idea that government must be all powerful, all perfect all the time, or we just get rid of it is libertarian ideology, and it's ludicrous. Anyway, back to the story. Guy at the craps table is all Benghazi. <laughs> By that time, me and a few of the scientists there at the table had realized that this guy was an idiot. Uh, that's me being polite. This guy was a nutcase. He, he was a fruitcake. So we started jeering him. Because <laughs> why not? We just I mean, we've had a couple of drinks. So we just started making fun of the guy. And oh man, that we really got his blood boiling. At one point we brought up climate change. And the guy started screaming, How much have you been paid? How much did they pay you to write the climate change uh, reports? To write climate science papers, how much do they pay you? <laughs> and I, I just kind of looked down at my chips, and I was like, uh, this much. <laughs> we were making fun of him. It was good. He eventually just snorted off. I, 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 that's really the only way that I can explain it. He snorted off from the table. He was like, Psst! and he just left. It was great fun. I think we all clapped and cheered when he walked away. But uh, that was an interesting interesting thing that happened to me out there in uh las vegas las vegas Las. i don't know they have their own way of pronouncing it and they're always correcting me when i go out there and pronounce it and they tell me that i'm pronouncing it wrong lots to talk about in the news now i did not actually get a chance to get all of that stuff lined up but we do have some news from germany germany it now seems 
is running 50% solar power at the start of June. That's this month. So remember, kids, they tell you that solar power does not work or it cannot work, but Germany is proving them all wrong. Germany will eventually get rid of all of their coal power plants and they will replace them with solar energy. It will happen. It's going to happen. It's only a matter of time. Meanwhile, China has brought in their engineers and they've said, we want to turn off all of our coal power plants. We want to replace them with solar and wind. We want our entire country to go solar. And the engineers have told them it's, it's going to take a couple of trillion dollars over 20 years. But the initial cost to establish the manufacturing base capable, uh, necessary to to make these solar panels for the whole country is a cost of only $10 billion. Ladies and gentlemen, $10 billion to China is nothing. They farted out that much money yesterday when they decided to build a new bridge or something. China is absolutely booming with infrastructure construction right now. The exact opposite of America. America's infrastructure is currently falling apart. Our bridges have a D minus grade on their viability and usability. Man, most of our bridges in America are, are 30, 35, 40 years old, and they're not even designed to last that long. Just remember that next time you get out on the interstate and you try to road trip with your, with your family. Most of the bridges that you go on are, are out of date, crumbling. It's, it's getting tough out there. Meanwhile... The EPA is attempting to set new rules, do air pollution guidelines to try to curb some of our carbon production, to try to minimize climate change. And the Republicans are responding by saying that they're going to shut down the government again. Ladies and gentlemen, please tell me that you do not have amnesia. Please tell me you remember the last time they shut down the government. Please tell me the last time they did this. You remember this. It was a failure. A lot of people lost jobs. The FAA, had, the Congress had to have an emergency uh, session in order to keep funding the FAA and keep it going because we were going to lose our ability for air travel. And they were going on vacation, so they couldn't have that. They can shut down the government, of course, but they've got to get to their ski resorts. They've got to get to their vacation homes. The rich people have to go play and, and sit around and not work. So they couldn't have that. So they were willing to keep funding the FAA so that they could fly around the country, but they were not willing to keep funding government agencies that help keep your life safe, like the EPA and the FDA the Department of Energy, stuff like that. The last time they shut down the government, it was a huge failure. It cost us millions of dollars. And now they're wanting to do it again. Why? Because they don't want our coal power plants to be restricted on how much carbon they produce and put into the atmosphere. This is a dangerous game that we're playing. Carbon right now in the atmosphere CO2 in the atmosphere is currently the, at the highest level it has been in the past 800,000 years. The top 15 years, the hottest 15 years in our entire temperature record for as long back as, as we can, we, we've been doing regular temperature records here on, on the planet, as long as our species has been measuring the temperatures regularly, the hottest 15 years on record were in the past 18 years. This spells disaster. The ocean is slowly turning into soda pop. It is being carbonated. There's a reason why they call it carbonation. And we're putting more carbon in the atmosphere. And that carbon sinks into the ocean. And it joins with the water. We are basically turning our ocean acidic. We're making it carbonated. Our coral is dying. Our fish are dying. Our plankton, what feeds the whales, is dying. 
The Antarctic ice sheets are melting. The o ocean currents are shifting. And they want to shut down the government because the EPA wants to make our air cleaner and safer. I can't say it enough. The Republican Party has become your enemy. They have become the enemy of the American people. They have become the enemy of human progress. They have become the enemy of science and technology. They have become the enemy. They will stop at nothing to make sure that their billionaires constantly hold on to the status quo because they don't care. They're all old rich people and they know 30 years from now they won't be around anymore so they're just trying to hold on to what money they have right now. Moving on quickly today on the People's Radio um, Not Really Prepared Edition. <laughs> Let's talk about solar freaking roadways. Now, solar roadways is a working concept currently that was designed by an engineer uh, and his wife. His wife helped. But this one guy basically came up with an idea that we're going to make the roadways out of solar panels and then put a uh, very hard durable glass rough surface glass on top that can handle you know cars and, and such so the roadway itself will generate electricity and then he said well if we're already generating electricity then we can actually put lights into it so we don't have to paint stripes we can just program it to do the the you know the road uh, paint. We can just program it to put the lanes and the lines. And, and Then he said, wow, we can even tell it to notify us of danger ahead and stuff like that. It's a good idea. It's a good concept. And he actually has a, a working version in his backyard that he's built and that he's been testing. But the design is nowhere near finished. In order for this to work, they're going to need more efficient solar cells, and more durable and, and better uh, glass. They're also going to need to find a way to make it in a cost-efficient way so that it, they can be replaced easily when damaged. And they're also going to need to come up with a, you know, a new, brighter, more efficient LED in order to make the lights work. Now, all of this is very doable with our current technology, especially with 3D printing, because if they come up with a finalized design, they can always do a, uh, a 3D print version so that you don't even have to have uh, construction workers making these on an assembly line. You can have a 3D printer just printing them out. And they're ready to go. This is totally doable. This is a workable technology. It's not a technology that is ready to be deployed tomorrow, but it is a workable idea. A team of some of the world's best engineers could definitely run with this idea, better it, and make it work. If not for roads, if not for roads, then this would still be a great idea for driveways and sidewalks and parking lots, rooftops, and such. This is a good workable idea, especially considering... MIT just recently came up with 50% more efficient solar panels. That's right. They even work in the shade. Are you in Alaska? Are you up in the UK? Are you constantly having cloudy days? Have no fear, my friend. We have new solar panels coming down the technology pike. And they are 50% more efficient. They even work on cloudy days. Solar is absolutely the future. That's what we preach here on the People's Radio. Now, let's get to the drama part of this. Solar Roadways put up uh, a Kickstarter or Indiegogo. I do believe it was Indiegogo page, and they were asking people, soliciting people for funds, saying, look, guys, we basically need a million dollars to finalize the design. We need to bring in manufacturing and production engineers in order to solve the problems that I previously mentioned just now. And the internet 
responded with a resounding, yay, we love this idea. We love solar roadways. We think solar roadways are going to be the next big thing. It's going to be awesome. And they gave them over $2 million and counting. Now, most of you who are already on my YouTube subscription list, not necessarily people who uh, are on the Facebook, the people's radio, and listen to the show, but of the 500 or so supporters on my YouTube page, you probably are already aware of YouTube user Thunderfoot. Thunderfoot, of course, his whole claim to fame was he found a teenage boy who was extremely confused about science, and then he publicly ridiculed him and mocked him for like uh, 28, 27 episodes titled, Why People Laugh at Creationist or, or something. Why do people laugh at creationism? Yes, why do people laugh at creationists? Part one, part two, part three, part, part four. I, it's a fantastic series. It's great because basically what it is is it's debunking Kent Hovind 101. I highly recommend you watch it. It's entertaining. It's educational. It's a good series. And it got Thunderfoot a lot of subscribers. And I do mean a lot of subscribers. He's one of the heavy hitters on YouTube. And so now he has a very successful YouTube channel. But Thunderfoot heard about solar roadways. Now remember, this is important to note. Thunderfoot is not an engineer he is a chemist, if I do understand his area of expertise properly. So Thunderfoot got all butt hurt that he wasn't getting $2 million for any of his ideas, which I'm not aware that he's ever actually projected an idea forward on the internet, except for perhaps Draw Muhammad Day or something of that nature. So he gets butt hurt that nobody's throwing $2 million at him, so he creates several videos where he's all, solar roadways are not doable, blah, 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 blah. And basically, he's just saying that the current prototype design is not durable enough, the LED lights won't work during the day, the solar cells are not efficient enough to power the system, and that, therefore, oh, let's just scoff at it, and it's a bad idea. Well, folks, I've already explained that the working prototype that the guy has made is just a concept design. It's not the final design. Now, imagine if everybody did that with every new invention, every new thing. Imagine, if you will, if every time a car company came up with a new model car, Thunderfoot come along and went, oh, 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 that door isn't the right size, that's not gonna work. Oh, 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 oh. You should just scrap the idea entirely. Folks, that's not, that's not an open mindset conducive to forward thinking and progression. That's, that's a very close-minded mindset that Thunderfoot is showing about solar roadways, because as I've said, even if it doesn't work for roadways, it's still a good idea for sidewalks and perhaps basketball uh, courts and parking lots and uh, perhaps even the tops of parking decks or the sides of parking decks. Uh, perhaps it can be adapted into some sort of construction material where they make walls out of this because they do seem extremely sturdy. And building walls out of real hard, sturdy glass does not seem like a bad idea uh, for, for smaller structures. Um, this, this is just, I mean, they make, People don't realize the manufacturing capabilities we have now. We have glass that's harder than steel now. We have glass that is extremely durable and extre extremely tough. People think glass and they think, oh, it's going to shatter, it's going to break. We can make glass that is really, really strong nowadays. So don't count glass out. And even if glass doesn't work, we have new plastics now. We have new 3D printing plastics now that we can print uh, uh, translucent. Uh, we can print them to be see-through. We can make this technology work. We just have to, it's just, it's with, it's the same story with all renewable energies. We have to decide we're going to build it. It's like going to the moon. Imagine if Thunderfoot was like, ah, you can't go to the moon. You 
you need a rocket ship to get up there and you're gonna need capsules that have oxygen and you're gonna need spacesuits which you don't have that's a dumb idea that's not how we move forward as a society that's not how we move forward uh it, with new technologies and new manufacturing capabilities we have to have forward thinkers we have to welcome challenges we have to welcome that things are going to be difficult that we're going to have to invent new things and we're going to have to figure out ways around problems and ways to solve problems that's how we move forward as a species that's how we move forward as a society and that's how we're going to build renewable energy we're just gonna have to toughen it out and say look it's gonna be expensive we have engineering problems that need to be solved but we're going to solve them. We're going to commit ourselves to doing it. We're going to commit ourselves to changing because we're going to have children and those children are going to have children and we don't want them to live in a dead post-apocalyptic world where 98% of all species on the planet are dead or dying and the ecosystem is ruined and the biosphere is ruined. We don't want them to live in a nuclear winter. We don't want them to live on the planet Venus with a runaway greenhouse effect. We want them to live in a nice environment and we should not just continually think that somebody else down the road is going to come and solve these problems for us and that technology is just going to magically invent a solution to all these problems. We have to be the ones to stand up and say, we are going to invent the solutions to these problems. We are the ones that are going to make the sacrifices necessary to do this and to make this happen. That's how our ancestors did it. We chose to go to the moon not because it was easy, but because it was hard. It was a challenge. It wasn't easy. It was something we had to work hard to do, like the Golden Gate Bridge. How many people died building it? Imagine if they said, oh, we can't do that because we don't have the steel and the manufacturing capabilities of the workforce to do that. They had to just tighten up their belt and say, gosh darn it, we're going to do this. When we were out in Las Vegas. We got to visit the Hoover Dam. We got some great photos. There are two structures right there. You actually have the Hoover Dam which in and of itself is an amazing construction project. 117 people died building the Hoover Dam. But you know what? They built it. They didn't come along and say, Oh, we can't build that. Do you know how much concrete that would take? That'd be too difficult. They built it. They tightened up their belt. They said, This is going to be expensive. It's going to be a challenge. There are going to be problems that we're going to have to solve. There's going to be engineering problems we're going to have to figure out. And they just did it, and they got to work on it. There's a second structure there right next to the Hoover Dam. It's this huge, new, modern, 21st century bridge that they've built going across the span so that you can now drive across. Because before, it was just a huge traffic nightmare because the road actually goes across the top of the Hoover Dam. So the bridge itself, or the dam itself, was actually a bridge that people drove. Now imagine this. This is one of the biggest tourist trap sites in the world. So people weren't just using the bridge to, to get around. They were actually slowing down to look-see and to look at the dam. So it was causing this massive traffic jam. And people hated and cringed, at, especially the locals, cringed at the thought of going out there and getting stuck in the traffic. So they built this huge, massive bridge that you could I mean we were up 30,000 feet flying over it coming back home and you could see this thing it was that big and they didn't say that oh this is going to be difficult they didn't say oh we're going to need to you know, come up with blah 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 so let's just not do it they didn't scoff at it they said this is going to be a difficult engineering thing it's going to cost a lot of money but we're going to do it because we need it and I'll tell you what else we need. We need renewable energy. We need a renewable energy grid. And if we're not going to build solar roadways, then we need to start building solar farms out in the middle of the desert. Trust me, we got enough. I just got back from there. There is plenty of land out there. There is tons of land. The desert tortoises won't mind. In fact, we'll probably just give them shade. And they'll be like, thanks, guys. I got some solar panels to get under during the hottest part of the days because the days are getting hotter because we are causing global warming. So think about it as giving back to nature 
because we are like, here's some artificial shade, my friend. We know you desert lizard is, is getting 112 degree heat instead of the uh, 102 degree heat that you're used to in, in the summer. So here, here's a little shade for you. Come on, let's just build these things. It'll cost a trillion dollars. It's going to cost an Iraq war. It's going to cost an Afghanistan war. It's going to cost a trillion dollars. But you know what? It'll be worth it. We'll have renewable energy. Renewable energy. Imagine how much cleaner our air would be if we just stop having this it's too difficult, it's too expensive mindset and we just pull our belt and we say, we're going to do it. That's what we need to do. That's what we need right now. That's what Obama was talking about when he said America needs its Sputnik moment. It's time for America to wake up and get back to work. I'm going to talk about one other piece of drama going on in the whole internet sphere. This one really chaps my ass because it's very personal to me. And then I'm going to allow the, the program to be closed out by a, an extremely short um, presentation, uh, a mini lecture, if you will, about the coming second machine age. And that's exactly what this program is about. That's exactly what we talk about here. The coming technological singularity and the second machine age is going to provide that for us. Continuing with YouTube news, there's this troll. There is the, I'm trying to be nice. You know, I, I just want to, I just want to, I just want to lay into her and call her what I really think. But that gives her justification. There is a radical feminist troll now let me clear the air here i believe in sexual dimorphism i believe that uh, human sexes are different but and i am a man but i absolutely 100 percent, and this is a very controversial opinion i absolutely 100 percent believe that the female gender is the superior gender of the human race it's the default sex. It's the sex that brings life into this world. And they normally are more logical when men are more, oh, let's, let's fight, let's rut, let's hit antlers. Females are normally a little more logical in their, their thinking, a little less emotional. Now that's completely just my opinion it's very controversial. And on another show, I think I'll try to lay out reasons for why I believe that, why I believe that, that they're superior. I mean, we can go into the scientific medical reasons, um, such as, you know, a fetus is, is uh, by default female until there's a surge of extra estrogen, which then causes it to turn into a male. Um, so, you know, by default, we, you've also got that we all basically came from a human female, mitochondrial Eve, you know, so, I mean, all life flows from female, and without female, we wouldn't be here today, so, I think that in and of itself, you know, and now with science and technology, they can, which, they could get rid of all, all males tomorrow, and, and females could still breed, thanks to, you know, stem cells, and the, the ability to take those stem cells and turn them into, into uh, sperm cells that can actually create sperm cells in the lab. I mean, we'll talk about that on another episode. I, I, I digress. So full disclosure has been given, even though I'm a male. Uh, I guess you can call me a feminist, although I hate the term, because it, is, it has been tarnished by people like this troll that we're about to talk about. Uh, but yeah, I guess you could classify me as a feminist because I believe that females are like super awesome. And I think guys normally just want to kind of butt heads and, and start wars and stuff. Not, not to say, you know, I mean, some of the greatest scientists in the history of the world have been man, uh, males, Nikola Tesla and such. Um, but, but uh, seriously, you, you look at the scientific achievements of, of, of women uh, throughout history, and they, they've been more tenacious in their scientific study. Uh, and in a lot of the cases, not all the cases, you can't just, you know, lay out a generalized statement like that. But there are a lot of examples in history 
especially watch watch Cosmos. You can see a couple where women were absolutely ferocious when it comes to seeking and finding evidence and the truth. Now let's get to the troll. If I call her what I really think she is, then that just fuels her narcissism and her delusions. She believes that she is important and that she is special and that people uh, want to hear what she has to say. But in reality, the internet just kind of tunes in to hear what fucked up shit she's going to say next because she's a really strange person who never in a million years could get a boyfriend. Her entire claim to fame is that she claims that one night at a conference she was once asked for coffee. And she went to the internet to bitch about it and to complain about it. And she was all like, guys, don't do that. What? Don't ask you for coffee? Come on, get out of here. Get out of here. Anyway, that was her claim to fame. That's how she became this uh, internet YouTube personality that has... Uh, subscribers that tune in to to hear her feminist crap. But she, and this is the reason why I call it feminist crap, because it's, it's, it's hyperbolic nonsense that not even she listens to, right? She claims that she doesn't want to be sexualized, but one of the first things that she did was she posed in a calendar in a sexual provocative way uh, to raise money for the James Randi Educational Foundation. So one of the first things that she did when on the internet, bitching about, don't sexualize me, don't sexualize me, was she sexualized herself to help the James Randi Educational Foundation get money. Well, now she's gone off the deep end because the president of the James Randi Educational Foundation is DJ Grothy. DJ Groth, however you pronounce it. Uh, this guy's fantastic, a very smart individual, uh, very focused, and he's leading the JREF to new heights as James Randi has now gone into a semi retirement status. Um, you know, even though he's good, healthy, and kicking, he's, you know, he's not the, the young spring chicken he used to be. Now, I am a James Randi Educational Foundation member. I support it 150 million percent. Um, I. I actually got my tools for critical thinking and learned how to question the world in a healthy uh, critical thinking way, in a, in a healthy skeptical way. I actually learned that from James Randi and his foundation. Um, it's how I know that people like Food Babe are completely full of crap. It's how I know. It's As Neil deGrasse Tyson said, when you arm yourself with the knowledge of science, you have the ability to defend yourself from those that would bullshit you. And the James Randi Educational Foundation, that's uh, jref.org, or uh, randi.org, my bad. It's r-a-n-d-i.org if you guys want to check it out. The James Randi Educational Foundation helps arm people with critical thinking skills so that they can know when other people are bullshitting them, like homeopaths or chiropractors or what have you. But anyway, so now she's completely flipped the script. She's turned around, and she claims that she hates this guy, DJ Grothy, because he's this sexist pig, and and he like he's defending Michael Shermer, who like groped a lady or something like that. I mean, she's basically shitting in the bed that she lies in. She is taking a shit on the community that has supported her and listened to her nonsense for years, and she's completely turned against them, and she's biting the hand that feeds her. Um, she used to go to these conferences and she was a speaker and she was asked her opinion and what have you, but now she has ousted herself and singled herself out and just been a real bitch. And so now they don't want her back and they've basically told her, just go away. You are a troll and we don't want any of your fake internet drama. So I just wanted to bring that up. Her name on YouTube, I don't like giving it out because I don't want to give her views. It's Rebecca Watson. Oh, just saying the name just just brings anger to me. She's such a troll. Have you ever met a just a cliquish person who believes that they are more important than what they are? A person who just, like, the type of person that could never make friends because they're just, they're so off-putting. 
Go check out our channel. See see what you see what you think. Don't take my word for it. You know, you might like her or whatever. She's just a radical feminist that says the craziest off the wall stuff, and she seems to hate everybody. Absolutely everybody. Um, she, she all she does is talk about how, how much she hates people. And a comment was once given on one of her videos that said, hey, why don't you just talk more about science and skepticism because that's what your channel is supposed to be about. And she responded with a video that said, hey, you guys that keep saying that I should talk about science and skepticism, you're worse than rape threats. I kid you not, this woman is crazy. She is insane. And not the entertaining type of insane. I find creationists like Kent Hovind to be entertaining in their craziness. This is just annoying craziness, angering craziness, infuriating craziness. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and end the program a little early so that we can have time to get in this very important talk. I hope you guys stick around and listen to it because this is important stuff. It's about the coming second machine age. Thank you once again for listening to The People's Radio. The game of chess actually provides one of my favorite examples for where we are in the interplay between people and computers. Because as soon as we invented computers, we started trying to teach them to play chess and to compete against real human beings. And there were these very confident predictions in the 50s and 60s that because chess is such a logical game, the rules are very simple to understand, computers are good at following rules, that within a few short years, computers would be the world's best chess players. And that's not what happened. Decades went by. And this is a picture of Gary Kasparov. I've actually had the, the pleasure of talking to him about technological progress. He actually blurbed our book, which I thought was phenomenally cool. And Kasparov says that he was the world chess champion during a really interesting period. When he became the world chess champion in the mid-'80s, as an exhibition, he played 32 simultaneous matches against the best chess computers of that time. Simultaneous, he won 32 to nothing. The computers at that stage were laughably bad at playing the game of chess when they went up against an absolute world-class human being. We see him here playing 10 years later, playing in 1997 against Deep Blue, against a purpose-built supercomputer to go up against Kasparov. And Kasparov narrowly lost that match and at that point, the torch got passed from human to digital labor in this specific domain of knowledge work, in this very specific domain of playing chess. That was the last time humans could claim superiority. Now, that head-to-head -head competition is not even close. The chess programs available on smartphones these days can beat almost anybody, and the best chess computers uh, just make mincemeat out of the absolute top human chess players in the world. It's so bad now that they asked a grandmaster a little while back how he would prepare for a match against a computer, and he said, I'd bring a hammer. <laughs> it took decades, though. What we're observing now is something a little bit different, which is the digital progress is getting a lot faster. Hemingway has a fantastic quote about how a person goes broke. He says, it's gradually and then suddenly. We've been in the gradual portion for a long time on some very tough problems, like natural language processing, like answering problems that aren't very well structured. We're now in the sudden part. The best example of this we came across recently was playing the game of Jeopardy, where you see two of the world's best knowledge workers in this domain, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, getting crushed in early 2011 by Watson, by another purpose-built supercomputer. What's fascinating to me about this example is this one didn't take decades. The IBM team started its work in late 2006. It took them about four years, just a little more than four years, to get so good that the absolute best knowledge workers in this domain 
were not any good at all. Just got steamrolled by the competition after four years of concerted effort. Ken Jennings uh, had a wonderful sense of humor about the whole thing. And he had a, a quote that kind of summarizes this head-to-head -head competition between human labor and digital labor in, in a lot of knowledge domains. He said, um, after he got beat, I for one welcome our new computer overlords. <laughs> he realized that in his very narrow, very specialized domain of knowledge work, again, the torch had been passed, and in a head-to-head -head competition, the machines were better than the people. And when we talk about this and give these examples of technological progress and technology racing past people, we, we very often get different flavors of, wait a minute, what about the following? For example, what about work in the physical world? What about you know, work that we do with our bodies? Technologies, robots, vehicles have been laughably bad. The, there's an old paradox that the easy stuff is hard and the hard stuff is easy. Any of us can walk across a room. Any of us can do this very easily. Robots and other physical machines, digital physical machines, are still really bad at a lot of that. But they're getting better super quickly. Um, burger flipper is kind of shorthand for an unenviable job that's always available. I'm not so sure anymore. Here's a completely automated hamburger making machine. It will evidently turn out 300 completely customized burgers an hour. Backing up one big step in the value chain, we've also got robots that will milk cows these days. And evidently the cows like this better because instead of getting milked at dawn and dusk, they just kind of pull in, it's not the filling station, I guess it's the emptying station. They just pull in whenever they feel the need and walk away feeling better about their life on the farm. Uh, robots are now at least probably better milkers of cows than we are. We see this all over the place. We are still better at walking across a room, but clever people at Kiva and companies like this have designed little, dro little squashed orange R2-D2s that do the walking around warehouses these days, so people don't walk the floor anymore. Those Kiva robots bring the shelves to the remaining human workers in the warehouse. Uh, Eric and I had the chance to ride in the Google autonomous car. We're here to tell you by our survival that it actually works pretty well. And it feels like it's only a matter of time before we've got, maybe in more remotely populated areas, before the convoy, convoys become completely autonomous. Going up into some of the most taxing, really physically demanding jobs, real Top Gun type stuff. Just last year, for the first time, they took off and landed a completely autonomous drone aircraft on the deck of a naval carrier. This is one of the hardest things for a human being to do. If the technology already isn't better than a Navy Top Gun pilot at that, it will be fairly soon. So even in the physical world, we see technology encroaching deeply, broadly, and rapidly, which brings up another but what about question. What about work that, that appeals to our taste? What about work that appeals to our aesthetic sense? Here is a painting. This is a drawing actually done by a, a robot called E. David. This is one done by a painting program called The Painted Fool. And I want to be clear, these are not Photoshop filters applied to a picture that a person took or a drawing that a person did. This is absolutely generated from scratch artwork. Maybe I just have terrible taste, but you know, I would kind of put these on my wall and be happy with them. Again, humans still hold the high ground here, but a mantra that I learned while researching the book was never say never. One final domain where people ask, what about, well, what about what we're doing right here? What about interpersonal skills? What about things like reading another's emotions or negotiating or managing or selling to them? Yes, absolutely. But let's think about the encroachment here as well. This is the best salesperson that I interact with every day. This is Amazon recommending the next round of stuff for me to buy with one click. And they do a surprisingly good job of it. This is, these are all books that Amazon recommended to me earlier today. And I found myself going, yep, 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 yep. I would go read all of those. Um, we humans are wired by evolution to sense what's going on with the emotions of others, but it turns out we can do a surprisingly good job of teaching that as well. This is emotion detecting software. I believe it's already as good as the average guy. <laughs> and maybe someday we'll get up into the area of, of, of female ability to, to understand what's going on with another human being, even though that's a fairly rarefied talent that 
very few men at MIT actually possess. Um, we should probably be clear about that. So again, this encroachment that we're seeing, this technological progress is, is, is very broad, very rapid, very deep, and, and feels like it's leaving few, if any, stones unturned. Technology is racing ahead. It brings up this pretty fundamental question, are we going to be left behind? Are we headed for some era of mass technological unemployment? In other words, do we have nothing left to bring to the economy or bring to the party in the face of this just astonishing technological progress? And the answer to that, fortunately, is I don't think so. Even after spending a lot of time immersing myself in examples of technological progress and being stunned over and over again at what's going on. I also see enough examples that convince me that we still have roles to play, even in this very, very technologically sophisticated economy that we're creating so quickly. Let me give you three quick examples there. I want to go back to chess for the first example. You remember that I said that the head-to-head -head competition between people and machines in chess is profoundly uninteresting these days. That's true. What's profoundly interesting is this. This is a freestyle tournament where you can bring any combination of human and digital labor and have it compete against other teams composed of arbitrary combinations of human plus digital. And what we learn from these freestyle tournaments so far is pretty fantastic. What we learn is that the, a, the rightly con composed team will beat any grandmaster. It will beat any the best chess supercomputer. It will actually beat the top grandmaster with the best chess supercomputer. Because the way to compose a team is to be very insightful about what people are good at versus what technology is good at and bring both of those strengths together. So what's going on with these tournaments, the winning teams these days, are really geeky people, very, very good computer scientists, who are at least pretty competent chess players, but they know how to put those two kinds of ability and skill together to let the people concentrate on what they are best at. And as in Kasparov's terms, that's coming up with a new idea. And even in a terrain as well explored as chess, there's still room for that spark of eureka. While the computers maybe tee up candidates and make sure that what the person comes up with is not a move that's actually going to get you in trouble three or four moves down the road. So we've got the, the computers teeing up interesting things, backstopping to make sure the people aren't making dumb mistakes, and that frees up the people to exercise their creativity, their spark, which the results show is still extraordinarily valuable. We see this over and over again. This is an amazing computer game called Foldit that simulates the folding of an actual protein. Uh, our cells are assembly lines for proteins, but just in the first milliseconds after they're created, they fold into their final shape, and we have no idea how. We can't simulate it, we can't bake it into software, we understand it very poorly. A really bright team of people a while back said, why don't we use the spatial reasoning abilities of human beings, tell them what rules we have, and get them to fold these proteins using whatever tools are between their ears, and we'll see if that will actually help us out. It turns out that the distributed crowd of people playing fold it usually does a better job at getting the final structure right than our best, most massive computers running simulations these days. What's even more interesting to me is who the people, the top Foldit competitors are. They tend not to be computer scientists or, bi or biochemists or doctors. They tend to be folk like this. Michael is a ninth grader. If he's had more than one biology class or chemistry class, I'd be really impressed by now. But he likes to play computer games. He spends hours a day getting good at it. And he and people like him are advancing our understanding of proteinomics by playing a computer game. I find that really fantastic and very hopeful for the future as well. Last example I want to give is one in the physical world. This is Baxter, which is a creation of um, MIT legend Rodney Brooks, the guy that brought us the Roomba. This is his latest creation, which is a uh, $20,000 humanoid robot that's intended to get a day's work done on the factory floor, which it does really well. Baxter works side by side with actual human beings. What's going on in this picture, though, is something even more impressive. What's going on here is that that person, that frontline worker in a manufacturing facility, 
is programming Baxter. And the way you program Baxter is not with a command line interface or a programming language. You grab it by the arms, you move it through the motions you want it to do, and you essentially say, you got that? Baxter says, yeah, no problem, and then goes on about the work. So these are fantastic new combinations of bringing people together with machines. These are not straightforward examples of substitution. These are examples of complements, of people coming together with technologies to do things better than either alone. I want to wind up with a couple watchwords that I think we need to keep in mind as we're designing our, our institutions and our organizations for the future. What should we, what, what, what policies, what watchwords should guide us? The first one is probably not that controversial to this crowd. It's innovation. The only way we are going to succeed in the second machine age is by continuing to innovate with our technologies. But more importantly, I trust the technologists, more importantly with our institutions, our policies, our business models, our educational systems, all of these other things that need to come together to create a great deal of value. Innovation sounds like an uncontroversial thing, especially here at MIT, but I want to point out a couple other watchwords that people appear to be using that I think are actually counterproductive in a lot of ways. Many folks seem obsessed with protection as a watchword. In other words, let's make sure that no one loses their job as a result of this new thingy out there. It's an absolutely terrible idea. It leads to these perversities like the fact that in Tampa, Florida right now, a limo has to charge at least $50 and wait for an hour before picking anybody up. Huh? This is a response of the, this is legislation that was supported by the taxi industry in the face of innovations like Uber. It's a terrible idea. In three states right now, you cannot order a Tesla automatic car from the showrooms the company has set up because of auto dealership protection laws in place. These are all efforts, this is a great phrase that Larry Lessig uses, these are all efforts to protect the past from the future not to protect the future from the past. And that latter is absolutely what we should be doing. The former is what we're doing way too much of. The other watchword we need to keep in mind, in addition to innovation, is inclusiveness, is bringing as many people along for the ride as possible, in every sense of the word, as workers, as participants, as people bought into our communities and societies. Notice the word I'm not using here is equality. I, like, I don't dislike equality at all. I like inclusiveness a lot better. Um, how many have ever heard of the book that Thomas Piketty just wrote called Capital in the 21st Century? Yeah, look, everyone's hand goes up. <laughs> I, you know, Eric and I wrote the book that people were talking about for a while, and then it feels like Piketty's book came out, and the whole crowd went, oh, wow, let's go look over here. <laughs> so thanks for that. Um, it's, a fan, it's an amazing book. It's a fantastic book. The problem is that Piketty's solutions are extraordinarily high taxes, deliberately confiscatory taxes on people at the top, on the 1% and the 1% of the 1%. His idea is let's basically take away their income and their wealth. Let's enforce e uh, e uh, equality, egalitarianism that way. And when you, he's explicit in the book, he says, look, doing this will not actually help out the people at the middle and the bottom very much. It's just the right thing for us to do because I guess rich people are bad. I don't, under, I don't get it. If it's a solution, the solution that's not going to help the struggling middle class, the middle class that's being hollowed out, the people being left behind by our educational systems, it is solving absolutely the wrong problem. So if we get our, our guiding words right, if we focus on things like innovation and inclusiveness, as opposed to things like complete egalitarianism or protecting the status quo, if we get those watchwords right, I like our chances a lot, even as we head deeper into the second machine age. Why don't we call it a day and have a drink? Thanks very much.